welcome. Welcome to church. Hey, my name's Caleb Lynch. Little disclosure, th disclosure this morning, I'm, I'm not at 100%. I'm at like 73%, maybe 66%. Um, so if you hear me start coughing uncontrollably, it's fine. I will live. Um, hey, we are, we are cruising along in our study through the book of Acts. Uh, it's been good so far. I've enjoyed it. Have you guys enjoyed it? Yeah? yeah? Um, would you put up the first slide for the, the book of Acts? Um, we've titled it, as a reminder, Filled with Power, Carry the Name. Um, the book of Acts, the story written by Luke of the early church and the, the movement of God into humanity where he and his spirit fill humanity, um, you'll see different times throughout the book of Acts, they call it being filled with power. So we stole that name. Um, and then we, we realized this concept, um, right, at the, right at the beginning of Acts, Jesus is with his disciples. He's getting ready to ascend. And he says, wait on the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes in power, he uses this phrase, you will be my witnesses. And it's this reality that once the life of Christ indwells you, you are now a witness to the world because you carry the name. You carry all that embodies the name of Christ Jesus is now alive within you. And so we, we wanted to see ourselves through that way. And so we, we, we had a picture created by our, our guy Jason Bartley um, of this idea of those of us who dwelt with the Spirit and this kind of this idea of, of wh whatever space we enter into um, it, is, it is spreading out from us because of the life of Christ that is within us. Today, um, if you were here last week, we, we got to watch the beginning of this day of Pentecost. And it was this amazing moment where um, they were all in the room together and, and like, like it sounded like rushing wind came in and then fire was on top of their heads. It was wild. And then they started speaking in different languages. And so we're right at the end of that moment where now these 120 people who have been filled with the living Christ are out on the streets speaking to all different types of people who are in Jerusalem for this festival, and they're speaking to them in their native tongue, and they're hearing it in their native tongue. And the response is, uh, from some, is, oh my gosh, what is this amazing thing we're seeing? And from others, it is, well, they must be drunk, is the response. We, get, we ended with that last week. And so, we pick up right at that moment. Um, sounds like there's thousands of them that have come running because they've heard this sound and they're seeing this phenomenon. And that's where we're going to pick up. A um, couple of things that I want you to look for, and you might write these down if you've got a pen or if you've got a journal with you. As we go through this, you're going to hear um, the very first Christian sermon of all time. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that for a second. But I want you to look for the transformation in Peter so you're going to see Peter giving this message. And if you remember, Peter was the one who, like 50 days earlier, um, denied Christ Jesus, right? This is Peter, the goofball that seemed to keep dropping the ball, right? And you're going to see him stand up, quote scripture, declare the wonders of God in such clarity and in such conviction and in such power that... Um, you're going to see the reality of this Christ that now lives within him. So I want you to look for that. I want you to look for the boldness of the gospel presentation. And, and what I want you to look for is, um, and watch for is the unscripted nature that is happening as Peter is saying these words. You've got to remember this was, like I, I spent hours writing a sermon out. Peter just stood up in a moment and gave this sermon and so I want you to realize this beautiful and look for this beautiful reality of Christ, his life, his words coming out of Peter, almost unscripted. And I want you to be encouraged by it because I believe that could be true for lots of us. I want you, um, I want you to identify as you go through this. You're going to hear Peter. Uh, I want you to identify, you can write this down, um, the realization of grace. You're going to hear Peter constantly say these words, you crucified Jesus. To all the people listening, he's just going to keep saying, you crucified him. You crucified him. And yet, what Peter is preaching is not a message of condemnation. 
It's a message of conviction, and it is an offering for them to be accepted into the kingdom of God through Christ Jesus. And so it's this amazing message of him telling a reality, but beckoning them home, even though they were the ones who crucified the king, crucified God himself. So I want you to look for that grace. I want you to look for the simplicity of his message. He's just going to preach Jesus. Period. He's not going to add much fluff. He's just going to preach Jesus, and I want you to see that. So it's the first sermon uh, that's ever taught. We we might be able to say John the the Baptist was teaching a sermon, and and that's great. But this is the first time that Christianity, as, as a people, as a church, right? This is the first time this is the church is born in this moment. And for the very first time, a human being and dwelt with the living spirit of God is going to give a sermon. And uh, we get about five minutes worth of that sermon. And I don't, uh, I want to say this as a disclaimer, um, you're not going to get five minute sermons out of me. Um, what I will tell you is next week, you will see that the words say this, this, this statement about Peter, and he went on exhorting them. So he keeps going. We just get five minutes of it. So um, I'm sure he went on for two hours. You're lucky to have me. I only go about 40 minutes. So um, my prayer for this sermon as we read it is that this sermon gives us a, a bit of a grit for how we carry that name of Christ and a bit of a boldness and a confidence that that same spirit that filled Peter on that day is the same spirit that fills you now. You ready? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> so if you've got your Bibles, it's Acts 2, 14. We'll, we'll, get, we'll go a little ways today. So, But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. It's 9 a.m. is the time. Um, If if you will, in your Bibles, underline, uh, because you're going to underline a different title in a second, but underline men of Judea. Underline that that phrase. He's going to do a really unique thing in a moment. He's going to call them something different when he gets into the heart of his sermon. But right now he's calling them men of Judea. He's giving them their regional ethnic title. All right, let's keep going. Verse 16. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. They shall prophesy. He's quoting um, the prophet Joel. These are words written long before this moment. And the, the question that gets proposed, are these men just drunk? What are we watching? This is wild. These are... These are a group of 120 people that have been mourning the death of what they believe to be the Savior of the world, huddled in a room, terrified for their own lives, and now they're out on the streets, and they are blowing up, right? They're they're out of control. They're excited. They're like, what is happening? This is amazing. And the people go, well, there's really only one answer to this mayhem that we're watching. They must be intoxicated. And Peter goes, no, 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 no. Listen to what I have to say to you. And he just starts quoting Scripture. He just starts quoting Scripture. And what he, what he says is, no, what you are watching is the thing that God told you would happen, which is that there would come a day at the beginning of the era of the Messianic age that the Spirit would follow the Messiah. The arrival of the Messiah and the Spirit would fall upon man. And that's what you're seeing, is what he's declaring. That's what you're seeing. It's interesting, if you go read Joel, um, he, it's, it's interesting, he writes, 
and in the last days, or he speaks in the last days. If you read Joel, it's, it's the word afterwards. So if you go read Joel, it's, it's this statement, afterwards, this will happen. Peter declares a statement that everyone in that room or everyone in that atmosphere would have heard. Peter is changing it, and he's saying, look, the moment has already come. We are in those last days. The Messiah has arrived. It's a really neat thing that Peter does with the Scripture there. Um, we currently, from this moment in history till now, and until Christ comes again, His second coming, we are living in what's called the Spirit Era, if you will. It's, it's the Messianic Age. It's the, it's the age of the indwelt Spirit of the living God and His church, His bride. Um, if, we were, if we were a Taylor Swift album, we would be the Spirit Era. Raise your hand if you got that reference. If you didn't, you're just okay. You're fine. Let me tell you what this means. Um, because we are living in the same era on which we are witnessing, uh, it means that you are, um, <laughs> you are fruit people and you are not check-the-box people. Here's what I mean. We live in the era of being spirit-led. Not We don't live under the letter of the law anymore. There was a season prior to the arrival of the Messiah where they were under the governance of a law, right? They had, they had 10 of them and a lot more that they created because, well, God gave some of them to them. But, um, and they, they, they were checking the box, right? They were living up to the checked box. But we are now in an era where we live by the governance of the living spirit that is alive within us. And we produce fruit we are known by our fruit, not by keeping the letter. Right? Here, here's, here's what 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6 says. Such is this confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Now that we, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So you are in the Spirit era, and this is what we are seeing. This is what he is declaring. This is what he is yelling out to all of them. No, they are not drunk. We have entered into a new era, a new covenant with a new governance called the Spirit of the living God. And you are watching with your own eyes this moment happened, the thing that had been talked about, the thing that had been promised, the thing that had been declared to follow the Messiah was the spirit age. Do you like that he uses the word, Joel uses the word all flesh? It would have been important in this moment for them to hear that because they are seeing that. Remember, in the room, those that were filled with the Spirit were men and women, and most likely children, in that room. And so now you have this, this people group that has been awakened to a new reality, and it's not just these old men Pharisees that are running the show. It is all who are now declaring the wonders of God. They're all out on the streets proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And he says, do you know why? Because it's what Joel prophesied, that when this new spirit, this new governance, this new power, this new life comes, it will fall on all flesh. And, and notice who he talks about. He talks about young men and young women. He talks about servants, right? He's making sure we understand that there is no distinction in this new age, no class, no sex, no age. All are ministers of this new covenant and this gospel message. Do you see yourself that way? All of you who have put the, your trust in Jesus Christ have been beckoned, have been called to be evangelists for the good news of Jesus Christ because all have received the Spirit, not just some. Why does he start his sermon with this? 
Why does he start with Joel declaring, this day will come, the spirit will fall on man, that is what you are witnessing? Because they trust the scripture, he's quoting their scripture, right? And he knows they believe this, he knows they've been waiting for this, and he knows that in recognizing that this moment is happening, there is one question that they are all then asking. There is one question. Who is the Messiah then? Because this final stage, this spirit age, this fulfilling of this prophecy of the spirit falling on man follows the Messiah's arrival. The King of Kings, the one who will save humanity, had to show up. That's why in Joel it uses the language of afterwards. So the question that all are standing there wondering is, okay, if this is true, what we are witnessing, which it seems to be true, who then is the Messiah? Who then is the Savior? Who then is the Christ? So watch what he does. Let's keep moving. We can keep going. Whoa, whoa, that's a different verse than we're working with. Keep going or go back. Yeah, here we go. There we go. There we go. Right here. One more. Sorry. He says this, men of Israel, hear these words. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. You see, he calls them by their spiritual name this time. He doesn't call them men of Judea. He calls them men of Israel, the people of the living God. He gives them a new title. But he also then starts his prim the prim primary part of his sermon with the name of Jesus Christ. But he doesn't just call him Jesus Christ. He calls him Jesus of Nazareth. And this is significant, for this is the name that they put above his head on the cross. He says this, He was a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in the midst. In your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Um, you're you're going to watch in Peter's sermon... And, and maybe this is something you write down cause, and, and kind of look for it as we go. Um, Peter is simply going to depict the life of Christ, the wonders and works. We just saw that. He's going to depict his death. He's going to depict his resurrection. He's going to depict his ascension. Next week, he's going to depict his salvation. And finally, he will depict the community of saints that have gathered because of him. And so he's just outlining these are the works of Christ Jesus. These are the things in which he has done. Um, if, you, uh, if you have a friend that doesn't know the Lord Jesus, has not uh, called upon his name for salvation, would you invite him next week? Um, the message we're going to teach next week, I think, will be one that uh, will be a clear gospel presentation and an opportunity um, to trust upon the name of the Lord. This statement, um, right in the middle there, as you yourselves know. This is interesting. He's, he's just declared, um, this, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was given to you by God to do these wondrous works. It's what it talks about. These mighty works that he's done. And, and Peter does this amazing thing. He goes, and, and you guys know about it. You saw it. You were here. You were witness to it. You saw him do the miracles. You saw him do this thing. You saw him do that thing. You, you were witness to what God was doing through this man. It's a bold statement. Because what he's essentially saying, right, is that there is no excuse for you. you. You know what you saw. You were around. You were in those large groups that would follow him saying, give us more, magic man. Right? You were there that day he fed 5,000 of you with like a little bit of toast and a little bit of fish. You know you were there. You were with us. 
But then he follows it up by this most profound and confusing statement. Look at these words. This Jesus delivered up according to the defined, definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Do you realize what he just said, this sentence? If you read it slowly, it's a little bit confusing. This was God's plan, and you did it. God planned for this to happen, but you are guilty. Isn't that crazy? This, this, this interesting moment where Peter has the courage to say, look, nothing thwarts God's plan. He's in charge. He holds every single one of the cards. You think this slipped by him? No, it didn't slip by him. This was actually part of his plan, that the Savior would have to be crucified for the redemption of souls, for the saving of humanity. You see, Revelation declares that at creation the Lamb was slain. This, this was part of the plan, that Jesus would come to earth to be the sacrifice for many. He goes, look, I'm telling you, this, this was already his plan, and he already knew about it, and you are guilty for crucifying him. Isn't that, isn't that an amazing statement? I want to I say this. The sovereignty and foreknowledge of God never excuses excuses the response and actions of a human being. All of us are responsible for our actions, and all of us will be held accountable for our actions. Do you know that? And that sounds scary when I say that, doesn't it? But there will come a day, li listen to me, everyone look right here for a second, there will come a day when you will stand before the judge. That you will stand before the judge the judge's name is Jesus. Do you know that? Do you know that Jesus Christ is the judge? And he, he will judge the living from the dead? And there will come a day where you will stand before this judge. And it says in Scripture that you will be held accountable for every single thing that you have done. And I don't know what that moment will look like. I don't know what that moment will look like. But it will be Jesus you're standing before. And I don't know if he'll ask you a question. I don't, know what, I don't know what he'll do. But I imagine this moment where he says, what do you have to say for yourself? And any of us that have trusted upon his name will point at him and say, you paid it all. You paid it all. And he will say, washed, clean, forgiven, redeemed, restored, Welcome home. That's what he'll say. For any of us that have put our trust upon the name of Jesus, when we stand before the ultimate judge on the day of judgment and have to give account for what we have done in this lifetime, if we have put our trust in Jesus Christ and only if we have put our trust in Jesus Christ, do we have any way home? Do we have any way home? Because it is only by the power of what he did on the cross and the finished work of his blood that makes any of us right or clean. He says this, he says, uh, Peter says, you killed him. You killed him, but God raised him. You killed him, but God raised him. Um, it's amazing that God has allowed for human beings to take life, right? But only God can raise someone from dead to life. And you know that um, what he says next is one of the most incredible, one of the most beautiful, profound statements. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. It's this interesting paradigm that we look at. We, we say that Jesus Christ conquered death because he defeated it. But listen... Death never had power over him. Death never had power over him. He could not be held by it. 
right? He was held down by it because God the Father was pouring out the wrath of humanity for our sins upon the Lamb. But God goes, look, come on. Come on. I'm going to loosen these pangs of death because this one, the Holy One, the Righteous One of God, He can't be held down by death. Death? This is the author of life. This is the one who holds all things. This is the one who has created light and dark. This is the one who holds the galaxies in place. And this is the one who who gets to declare who is living among the dead. Like, this is the one who conquers death. Of course he conquers death. He is life in itself. So God sees the death and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and he goes, that payment is due in full and you paid it in full and now we release the bondage of death because death couldn't hold you anyways. It's a beautiful declaration of who we have now trusted. I love this moment in, in, uh, in John 11, 24 through 26. Lazarus has just um, died and, and, and Martha comes out to meet Jesus and she's like, yeah, had you been here, had you been here, he wouldn't have died and, and, and Jesus goes, no, no, you don't understand. Martha said, uh, said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And then Jesus said to her, maybe you don't understand, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Death has lost its power because it never had the power. And if you belong to him, you are victorious over death because his resurrected life is your resurrected life right now. Let's keep moving. Next verse, yeah. Did I, did I misorganize them back there? I think I did. Will you, will you, can you try to find verse 25? Hmm, I don't think I put it in there, did I? Did I tell you I was sick? Did I tell you I wasn't well? <laughs> Uh, let, me, let me read these verses for you. This is uh, verse 25 through 28. He follows this up. He says, uh, For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I, might, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you make me full of gladness with your presence. It's interesting, in the midst of his sermon, he's, he's doing this beautiful thing where he just keeps quoting Scripture to convince the hearts of those that are listening of the realities of God and that he has this planned out and that he has seen this beforehand and that the things you are watching have been told to you that they would happen. Um, will you go to the next slide? pick up at 29. Yeah, there we go. Look at us. We're doing it. So he's just quoted King David, right? And he says this, brothers, may I say to you with confidence about this patriarch David, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us. Like literally where he was probably preaching from, he could, he could point over to the, to the, what is it, the eastern side of the Mount of Olives where the, where the tomb actually was. Like he literally could have been like, look, You know King David. We see his tomb. He's there. He died, and his tomb is still there. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This is really a cool thing that he's doing here. He's quoting King David, and you just heard me read it. We didn't have a slide for it. And it's all about this, this, this idea that King David is saying, I, I saw the Lord. He did not let me die. He did not let me stay dead. He raised me, and I am alive with him. It's this, it's this, it's this gladness of presence with him. Well, that's not actually David's reality. That's the reality of Christ Jesus. And so what he's saying in this moment is he's saying, uh, David was actually prophesying about the resurrected Christ. And so when when we tell you the story of the resurrected Christ, 
you need to know that this was already predicted by King David. It's a beautiful moment that he's doing, and it's pretty complicated, but they would have known this scripture well. I want to encourage us. Um, Peter's just dropping scripture. Right? He's just up there talking, and all of a sudden a scripture comes to his mind, and then he, then he kind of defends it, and he kind of explains it. Um, what, one of the things I would encourage you to do um, as those filled with the Spirit of the living God, carrying the name of Christ, um, one, one really beautiful gift, because it can be kind of intimidating to share your faith or to share, share what you believe God's done and what he's... Um, have a few verses that you have saved to memory, that you've just kept in your heart, that when someone asks you about the hope that you have sealed up in here, you can say, look, I, I, I know this, this verse, this testament of who God is, and you get to declare it. And so I would encourage you, find, find three or four of those verses that have had a huge impact on your life and keep them for these moments when God is calling you to share his good news. Um, significant what he's doing, and I, and I think this is something that we can use um, as, as something to learn from. I think oftentimes... Um, what we do when we try to convince people of the goodness of Jesus Christ is, is, we, is we try to meet them at their paradigm of what they want Jesus Christ to be. And, and, we, and what we try to do is we, we try to say, yes, Jesus is that for you. Right? And, and what Peter is doing, remember, they, they had a vision of who they thought the Messiah would be and how he would come and what he would do. And he didn't do that. And so Peter's having to go back and say, look, you guys kind of missed it. I want you to know, look, Joel told you this would happen this way. David prophesied that he would rise from the grave. He's going to go on in a moment. He's going to talk about how King David prophesied that Jesus Christ would be raised to the right hand of the Father. And he's going, you, you had a different perspective of who Jesus Christ was, the Savior of the world was going to be. Can I tell you, that he actually promised you that he would be all these things, that he would come all these ways, that he would do all the things that he's doing in the way in which he's doing them. You just painted your own picture of what you wanted him to be. And, and I, think, I think that's something important for us to learn, is that um, when you're going to proclaim the name of Jesus, proclaim the name of Jesus. The glory and the wonder and the majesty of what he has done holds itself up. It needs nothing else. It needs no, no more of your persuasion to try to make it sound better than it is. It is the most glorious thing that has ever transpired in all of the history of the world. Preach Jesus. Preach who he is, what he did, why he came, how he came, and what he is still doing. And you will proclaim the good news of Christ Jesus, and it will transform lives. All right, verse 32. This Jesus... God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make my, your enemies your footstool." Again, he quotes King David, but what he is prophesying about is the ascension of Christ Jesus. And he is kind of repeating what he has already said. Let's, let's finish with this last sentence. And so he, he declares this as his kind of final closing remarks of his sermon. He says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you crucified. That's a bold way to finish a sermon. As a preacher, you, you, don't always, you don't always end with the little strong, like, you crucified him line, but 3,000 came to know the Lord right after this, so who am I to say? His ascension leads to his lordship. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the work that he did on the cross that we will celebrate in a moment through taking communion proves that he is the Christ. 
His resurrection from the dead proves that, that he had power over sin and darkness. And his ascension, his, his floating up into the heavens, is this beautiful picture of God taking him and seating him back where he rightfully belongs, which is at the right hand of the Father. Um, this, this is actually kind of a bold statement. Um, do, uh, let me say it this way. I, I think the evangelical church loves to proclaim the message of Jesus as Savior and um, doesn't often, as, as often, and, I, and I'm guilty of this as well, of preaching that he is Lord. If you're going to choose to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Redeemer of your soul, the one who has bought you back by the blood of the Lamb, the one who has washed you clean, the one who has made you whole, the one who has promised you life after death, the one that has promised you life right now, if, if you're going to trust upon that name, you have to also trust on the reality that He is Lord of all things, that He governs all things, that He is seated on a throne continually, that He continues to live in intercession on your behalf, and that He is sovereign over all things. And what that means is at the same moment that we worship Him for His saving grace, we also must find ourselves falling at His feet in surrender to His Lordship. He is calling you to the best life. And all he is asking is, will you trust me with your life? Will you surrender your life? Will you hand it over to me? I love you so much. I'm crazy about you. I went to the ends of the earth. I went all the way to the cross to save you, to make you new, to make you clean, to give you a new heart. Will you trust me with your life? Will you trust that my way is good? Will you trust, me, trust that my design is whole and is right? Will you come under the way in which I have designed all things to be? And I think it's a beautiful way to finish this. It's amazing that um, the very people that crucified him are also being given the grace to know him, are being given the opportunity to receive him as Lord and Savior, as Christ and King. And so let's, let's end right there. Let's pray for our communion and uh, thank the Lord for all he's done. Lord Jesus, we... We come before you right now and we, and we stand in this posture saying you are the great I am. You are the one who has done the unthinkable. You are the one that has redeemed a broken people. And you are the one that has saved humanity. And Lord, you are seated because the work is finished and you are seated. And so now, Lord, we come under the seated king. We surrender ourselves under the seated king. And one of the things you've asked us to do, Lord Jesus, is you've said, as often as you think of me, as often as you gather, would you take this bread and would you take this cup and do it in remembrance of the cross, do it in remembrance of the most great day in all of history, the most sacred day in all of history. And so we do that right now, Lord Jesus. We take this bread and we take this cup and we do it in remembrance of you. We love you and we give you our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.